welcome to this week's episode of the Good Gram Show with me, Chris Gram. Firstly, um, a big thank you to everybody that commented on uh, last week's episode of the show and uh, apologies for not replying to those comments <laughs> as yet. It was, it's been a bit of a busy week, to be bluntly honest with you, and I've just not had the time. Um, I will, uh, well, yeah, I'll probably add some pithy comment, I suppose, but no. Um, in essence, I think that the, that the bulk of the comments were, were about ABV, or the alcohol of... Uh, certainly some of the, the whiskies that I was tasting last week and yes I kind of agree with you 40% and even 43% in some cases is is just a bit too low uh, the, the whiskies kind of lack a bit of body they certainly lack intensity and um, I can understand why some distilleries bottle at sort of 40% I mean you know there's, there's no real reason for bottling at 40% it's an arbitrary kind of number um, but obviously the higher the alcohol content, the more duty, the higher the, the cost of the, the, the bottle, etc, etc, etc. And as you well know, a lot of the whiskies that are bottled by the, the, the big distilleries, you know, are designed to fit into certain price price points and certainly travel retail and all this kind of stuff and you can understand why some are bottled at 40% but you know when you're looking at sort of whiskies in the mid-teens and even 20s and you're sort of like still seeing them bottled at 43% you're thinking why you know okay so in some occasions the casks may well have naturally dropped to that point I've certainly tasted single cask bottlings of 20 25 year old whiskies that have dropped to sort of around about sort of you know, 41 42 percent um, but by and large you know you can quite happily bottle a sort of an 18 year old at 46 percent or even 50 percent and that extra alcohol adds the more intensity it will often sometimes it will mask the whiskey and you will need to put a little drop of water with it and yeah, there we are in another sort of whole um, spectrum of bottlings you know the wonderful thing about the cast strength bottlings is that you have the flexibility to do that you can drink them at their, their natural cast strength 50 odd, odd percent or you can put a little drop of water with them see what happens how will they change and um, so you'll be pleased to know that I'm tasting some cast strength whiskies this week and I thought it's about time we did a, a bang up to date episode of the show and as you can see from the title page we're looking at again a selection of bottlings in the Carnmore celebration of the cask range and I don't apologise for doing it they bottle some bloody good whiskey in that range they also bottle a few stinkers um, more often than not in the strictly limited range and um, th this brings me on to another point oh, bloody on my soapbox today um basically um a, a few weeks ago uh, another independent bottling company sort of uh, you know just asked me what i thought of their latest batch of samples and i said yeah yeah by and large pretty good apart from one which i thought was pretty awful didn't quite say pretty awful but i said i didn't think the quality was very good um and the reply came i think it was a fairly old or Kreuzsk actually and it, it wasn't very good spirit to start off with and the, the, the wood was not very good at all and I think you can figure out the end result of that um, and anyway so uh, the reply came back saying well that's a quite a surprise we've had lots of positive feedback about that particular bottling and I thought well that's it this is the whiskey industry in a, in a sort of a nutshell nobody likes to offend anybody everything is very very nice and lovely and wonderful and nobody really tells the truth well i, I try um yeah it's got me into trouble a few times but the point being is it's sort of like you know if you're bottling a good whiskey great i'll praise it if you're bottling a poor whiskey then obviously i will let you know and i will let whoever's bottled it know that i didn't think it was very good you know it's not i'm going to come on here and surprise everybody um and you know by and large i prefer to sort of praise Caesar rather than bury him as they say so um, but you know there's always parameters isn't there so anyway like I was saying this week's episode of the show is uh, featuring you know, six car strength whiskies that have been recently released and um, I think uh, I think there's uh, there's also a tie-in with 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 last week's episode of the show in actual fact, um, but we'll obviously get onto that when I introduce the, the lineup. So um, I think we'll just uh, just do that, shall we? Okay, so 
This bottling, the very first bottling, is indeed a tie-in to last week's episode of the show. It is a blended malt called Wardhead. And you're probably going, what the bloody hell is Wardhead? But a number of you will indeed know what Wardhead actually is. And the tie-in, obviously, is that it is Glenfiddich. Well, sort of Glenfiddich. Um, there are distilleries, such as Glenfiddich and Glenmorangie, funnily enough, that would like the public to believe they do not sell any of their casks. And we know that's a bit of... Um, technical term there. And um, they will go to extraordinary lengths to make sure this doesn't happen. And what they do is they teaspoon their malt. So they take a cask of their malt and they add a teaspoon of another malt. Uh, in the case of Wardhead, they use Balveni and it, with Glenmorangie uh, you will often find bottlings called uh, Westport which is teaspooned with uh, Glenmoray and so it makes no difference practically to the flavours and the aromas um, but of course legally it is no longer a single malt whisky it is a blended malt whisky and cannot be called Glenfiddich so hence these names, you know, Wardhead and um, Westport. And um, I think this is the, I mean, I've had a few um, uh, Westports, but I think this is the first time I've ever come across a, um, a Wardhead. So uh, I was quite looking forward to it. I mean, I know it's just 21-year-old Glenn Fiddick, but 21-year-old Glenn Fiddick uh, at... <laughs> nowhere near the price of the 18 year old um, so anyway uh, this is a single bourbon hogshead bo uh, uh, cask 43 distilled in February 97 bottled in August of 2018 at 54.6% and is 20 years old second bottling we'll be looking at is uh, we're obviously back to the single malts now it's a Glen Keith uh, it's a 29 year old Glen Keith distilled in October of 1988, bottled in August of this year at 42.5. So, as I was saying, natural alcohol and below 46%. Uh, it's a single bourbon barrel, number 26895. I do like Glen Keith, you know. Um, it's one of those distilleries you don't really hear about. They don't make a big fuss about it. They just go along their own little way, making you know good whiskey, and it appears every now and again on the independents. Um, third bottling we'd be looking at is uh, the first of two sherry hogs heads. Uh, this is a Klein Elish, uh, 21 year old, distilled in 1996, bottled in August of 2018 at 51.6%, and the cast number is 8805. Now you know I prefer my Klein Elish in uh, American oak, but we shall see what that one's like. And the fourth bottling is uh, quite an expensive one. This is a 22-year-old Highland Park, again, a uh, Sherry Hogshead, number 2476, distilled in November of 1995, bottled in April of 2018 at 54%. And on to the two peated malts to finish off, because, as you know, I like a bit of peat. Uh, Leche. Ooh, old Leche. Ooh, ooh. Oh, we could be dicing with death here. Um, so this is a 20-year-old Lecce, uh, distilled in April of 98, bottled in August of 2018. Again, a single bourbon hogshead, uh, 700 245 is the number, and it was bottled at 54.7%. And finally, a bit of Coalila. Uh, so this is, I was quite surprised actually, because, you know, most of the, um, bottlings in the uh, celebration of the cask range tend to be fairly old. They will generally tend to be at least 18 years old and, and, and over. Uh, this isn't. It's 11 years old and I'm thinking well, that's got to be pretty bloody special then, hasn't it? So this is uh, distilled in um, 2006, bottled in August of 2018 at 57.5%. Again, single bourbon barrel number 3087 Three, seven. So I think that's going to be an interesting one to finish on. So, so there you go. That's this week's episode. Uh, ready to rock and roll. So let's um, let's kick off with a bit of uh, <sighs> Okay. Let's uh, take a look at the nose and see what it gives us, then, shall we? That is lovely. That is classically crisp fresh, minerally, um, 
Fiddick. It's got that lovely, oh, it's got that lovely sort of austere edge and a honeyed middle um, touch of spice, some lovely barley notes. So much more concentration than um, uh, the distillery bottlings. It, you know, it's got. I suppose it's probably a little bit um, like the um, the fifteen year old, the sort of distillery edition, um, because it has that lovely sort of minerality, that lovely sort of emphasis on the um, the crisp character of the uh, uh, the malt. But it's got some lovely depth to it. There's a little earthiness kind of creeping through. Like I said, some soft spice, a bit of vanilla. Not a huge amount of vanilla in actual fact. So i um, guessing sort of probably a refill hoggy. Um, but just enough, just to sort of sit there in the background and just, just add some um, some structure. Um, that is, that's a lovely nose. Really nice. Let's see what the power's like. As a finish, really citric, really mineral, lime conserve. Oh, that's got some, got some kick to it. I can tell you. Um, but it kicks off with some lovely honeyed notes. It's quite rounded. Plenty of barley. It doesn't really taste 21 years old. Although the aftertaste, you're getting some of that oxidised apple and apricot kind of character. Um, softly spiced, really intense. Um, yeah, that is absolutely gorgeous, and I love the progression from the sort of like the honey and the vanilla through to the sort of a little bit of uh, almost kind of tangerine, um, and then you get the lime conserve, and then more lime and lemon and minerals. And mm. I'm going to put a little drop of water with it and just see uh, what that does to it. Um, although I don't think it really needs it, even though it is 54%, um, but we shall just uh, see what uh, a little drop of water does. Makes it a little fatter, a little bit more oilier, a um, bit more barley, less mineral, less crisp citrus. But it has brought out a little bit more oak, more barley. Um, I mean, that's still absolutely gorgeous, absolutely lovely. And that's what I love about some of these more quirkier whiskies um, with regards to names, because they sit on the shelf and, you know, people go, what the bloody hell is that? And then you explain to them, and they go, ooh, didn't know that. Um, and, and then I can point out, you're getting an absolute bargain. And they go, wow, okay, well, I'll buy one. Um, anyway, let's see what passes like now. Fuller, creamier, brought out the oak a little bit more, more honey, less citrus, less minerality. Although it is definitely there on the finish and it's just a, not quite an echo, but it's just a sort of, you know, very softness, uh, softness of citrus. <laughs> mm. um, if you get what I mean. Getting a little bit more coffee now. I mean, it certainly brought out the oak, so I'm getting a little bit more, like saying, a little more coffee, a little bit of toffee. Um, so and this is the wonderful thing about car strength whiskies it's how do you want your whiskey you know do you want it sort of intense minerally and and um, citric then drink it neat if you want it with a bit more oak a bit more but of course this doesn't always apply to every car strength whiskey as we well know but certainly with regards to this one it's uh, oh, with or without water that's bloody good <laughs> Okay, let's move on to the Glen Keith. So this is 29 years old and bottled at 42.5. Let's see what those gives us on this. Oh, fab, absolutely fabulous. It has that wonderful, mature, slightly tropical fruit kind of character. Um, kiwi, apricot, touch of lemon, barley. It's got quite a minerally edge to it again it's more stony than than minerally i would say um 
it's got some lovely sawdusty American oak but that is not the kind of main focus again the oak is kind of you know quite restrained sat in the background um, and it's kind of letting the sort of like the, the, the mature uh, character of the spirit kind of come through touch of gooseberry now I mean that is just oh just stunning absolutely stunning and I had to buy some of this because this is yeah, you know, I, I this is just my kind of old whiskey, wonderfully tropical, fruity, you know, balanced, you know, bit of oak. Um, oh, absolutely stunning. I mean, I can't remember what I've got it on the shelf for, but it's obviously three figures, two hundred and something odd, I'm guessing. Um, but my God, that's good, absolutely gorgeous. And again, it's sort of like. I come across quite a number of old Glen Keiths and uh, you know, they age really, really well, you know, and it's sometimes just worth, you know, looking at some of these more, I wouldn't quite say obscure distilleries, but less well-known distilleries, and uh, you can still pick up some absolute bargains in, in relative terms, of course. Um, let's taste it there. Excuse me. Um, a little more creamy, softer, a little bit more oak on the palate. Um, touch of barley, nice sort of nip of the spices. Um, the alcohol certainly sort of doing its job and just sort of balancing up the sort of like the richness um, of the oak and the honey. A uh, touch of dried fruit, a little less tropical on, on the palate, a little bit more of that almost cognac-esque um, dried fruits, dried apple, wonderfully vibrant finish though, I'm getting a little bit of lime, some gooseberry, uh, a touch of spice, um, oh that's such a lovely finish, a little, it's all kind of unlayered, it's all wonderfully layered with sort of oak and barley and malt and spice and oh, mm, I mean that is just absolutely stunning, it's not overly exuberant it's kind of quite restrained and just just wonderfully you know it's one of these sort of whiskies that you just kind of have to think about and just kind of like you know kind of go with the flow so to speak um and then it kind of grips you by the throat and uh, gets you coughing no um that is just mm, that is just stunning Right, okay, let's, uh, let's have a bit of sherry then, shall we? Okay, so this is the 21-year-old Klein Ellish, and um, 21 oh, Klein Ellish is, is not cheap at all. Um, and so let's see if this is worth it then, shall we? Hmm, um... Sherry character, obviously, it's a bit kind of... It's pr all right. Positives, pruny. It's not dirty. It's no nothing wrong with it. It's not a, a bad whiskey. It's pruny, slightly walnutty, dried fruit. There's a you kind of get a feeling of citrus, and you get a feeling of barley, but it's kind of. I, I'm guessing a refill hoggy. It's not obviously not first fill, although it is pretty dark in actual fact. Um, and it's not a sort of a big overwhelming Oloroso monster um, but obviously the sherry is kind of quite dominant it's got it's getting quite PXy now um, getting sort of dried grape treacle and I'm re really that's now starting to lose any semblance of distillery character um, and I love Klein Ellis it's a gorgeous malt why why sherry I mean you know um, it just does it absolutely no favours whatsoever. I mean, it's a very clean sherry cask or uh, hoggy, um, and so you know if you love that kind of kind of whiskey, then this is obviously right up your street. And it's uh, getting a bit of chocolate and licorice. But you know, if I I'd been tasting this blind, I would not have figured it was Klein Ellis. I mean, you, you you sort of like think well. 
it's obviously kind of got a well I mean you can't even it, it could be a spade, it could be a highland could, you know really uh, at the end of the day but I suppose the sort of like I said the big plus point is that no sulphur anyway let's see what the palette goes Big, chewy, malty, touch of cold tea on the finish. Um, again, it's, it uh, doesn't say Klein Ellis to me. It's, it's not got the elegance. It's just, again, all about the sherry. And um, again, the sherry is perfectly clean. You get the treacle, you get the dried fruit, um, some lovely spiciness, um, quite a sort of uh, citric, spice and, uh, citrus and spice finish. Uh, and aftertaste, um, yeah, I mean, quality-wise, I've got no issue with it. it. It is absolutely stunningly good um, sherry cask. Uh, it's just, it's not floating my boat, it has to be said. And certainly when, you know, the numbers are three figures, it's kind of like, well, I'd rather have, you know, the, the, um, uh, the Glen Keith, to be bluntly honest with you, it's got more personality, more character, um, than the Klein Elish, and um, that's, it's just all down to sherry casks at the end of the day. Okay, so, and it's another sherry hoggy, and this time it's a Highland Park, and yes, this time it's even more expensive, you know, um, but then that's Highland Park for you, isn't it? So, let's see what the name knows give us on this end, shall we? Again, a lot of sherry. Um, a little bit more treacly, more, more, more sherry than than the Klein Elish. It's kind of yes. There's some nice, you know, earthy peat notes behind it. There's a touch of coastalness. Um, there's some earth, toffee, licorice, dried fruit. But again, it's like you know, you you. Could it be Talisker? Possibly. Could it be Highland Park? You know, it's another one of those that you really haven't got a clue where the hell it comes from. It's kind of saying, yes, I'm possibly an island. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, yeah, again, totally clean, 100% blemish free, great cask. Um, it's just kind of. You know, and you know it's going to be bloody expensive because it's Highland Park and it's kind of like, you know, I want bloody fireworks from old Highland Park. Um, and, you know, I'm not I'm not getting it. I'm getting, yeah, all right, it's cherried, you know. Um, I mean, you might think I'm being a little bit harsh on it, it has to be said, but, you know, you know when, when you're asked to fork out, you know, nearly £250 for a bottle of whiskey... I want orgasms, and I'm not getting it, you know. Um, but anyway, you know, the the nose is good. It's pleasant. It's, you know, pretty much as you would expect, shall we say. Anyway, let's see what the power's like. Now the palette is a little bit more interesting, I would say. It's more dusty. It's it's kind of earthy. I'm getting grit. Uh, I'm getting wood smoke. I'm getting peat smoke. I'm getting a bit of licorice, toffee, treacle, tar. Actually, it's got a lovely finish to it. Um, it's a little bit drying. It has to be said. It's a little bit tannic um, and and quite salty. Um, I think the palette is just way more interesting than the nose, it has to be said. But again, it's I would be struggling to sort of say that's definitely Highland Park. You know, I'm not getting any of that kind of like fragrant uh, sort of honeyed notes. I'm not getting any of the sort of, you know, sort of slightly kind of heathery sort of peaty kind of character. It's, it's all sherry centred. And, you know, again... If that's your bag, then yeah, go ahead, spend 250 odd quid or 245 as the case may be. Um, but you know, when 
When I, I personally got limited space uh, available to put these bottlings in because they come into right, you know, really nice wooden boxes, as you well know, um, but they take up a lot of room. So, you know, I have to kind of like go, you know, what do I really want? What really does it for me? And what would I, you know, um, encourage somebody to spend, you know, quite a fair amount of money on? And, you know, the Glen Keith and the Wardhead, I mean, the Wardhead's, what, about 120 quid? For twenty-year-old um, uh, Glen Fiddick, which I think is, is you know, a cost strength, I think it's pretty damn good value for money, personally. Um, and uh, the Glen Keith, you know, is is something more. You know, I would just go, oh God, that's bloody gorgeous, you know. And it's not as expensive as the Highland Park, um, so it's a bit of a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Right, okay, so, old Leche. See what the nose gives us. You know what? That is actually bloody good. Um, oh, hallelujah! Um, yeah, you can, you can hear it going on. Um, it's really meaty. It's kind of bacon fat and, um, you know, um, pork and... God, I'm bloody hell, you know, it's kind of pork scratchings and, um, God, lovely, earthy, intense peat, um, edgy, and, and clean. I mean, I'm just, just blown away, and it just goes to show that every now and again you get an old leche that is just really clean, you know. All right, you, the meatiness, I suppose, is kind of technically in inverted commas a bit of a fault but it's not an unpleasant sort of it's not sweaty socks it's not kind of ascetic it's not kind of uh, dirty it is just big and meaty you know it's kind of what what was the album um meaty beat oh, I, I don't know big and bouncy or something like that i think it was rolling stones wasn't it that um or was it the who i think um anyway i mean this is just absolutely stunningly good um I'm getting a touch of violets. That peat is just wonderfully intense for a 20-year-old whiskey. And, um, yeah, there's a touch of manure kind of coming through now, but I don't mind a bit of manure, you know. Um, oh, that is, that's, that, that is, that's what I want from my leche, all right? You know, and, um, yeah, and I've, as I've said on many occasions, I really do think the distillery have cleaned up their act, and I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, some of the, the, the stuff that they've distilled in the last sort of, right, five to eight years will eventually mature into, you know, some really good spirit. I mean, not to say it's not too too bad at the moment, but, you know, a lot of old leche is kind of like, you know, as you well know, and this really bucks the trend. <coughs> so much so that I had to buy some. Can you believe that? Um, hmm. I even bought this, <laughs> talking of... Um, the Tobermoria that they, they they bottled a nine-year-old Tobermoria in the strictly limited range, um, which although wasn't the most majorly complex malt on the planet, was just unbelievably clean, and it was just sort. I just thought I've got to have it. You know, I've got to put it on the shelf and go. Look, I've got a Tobermoria on the shelf. You know, um, to which people would be going, bloody hell, it must be good anyway. It's not going to sort of you know blow you away with complexity, but it's just kind of like you know that's. It was just an, a good Tobermory, a good expression. Anyway, um, <clears throat> we're not talking about that. We're talking about this one. Let's see what the nose, the palate gives us, shown, shall we? Wow! Where do I start? Okay, so lots of burnt wood embers, peat smoke, grit, um, touch of tar, but honey, honey, um, rich, mature fruit, barley, um, wow, clean, yeah, touch of meatiness, yes, I'll give you that, um, touch of earth, real salty intensity on the finish, um, really briny, but it's got that honeyed note which is balancing I'm going bugger me is this old leche and I'm just going you know it's just 
beggar's belief, you know, and it's just like, well, if they could have made that sort of quality of spirit way back then, you know, you, we wouldn't be in this position of sort of like saying, yes, you're a fully paid up member of the axis of evil, you know, if you'd have carried on making spirit this good, then, you know, you, but anyway, um, it's always nice to come across something that just kind of like just re blows you away because you're just not expecting it, you know. And it's it's partly we have expectations of certain distilleries, and this is one of the wonderful things that I love about whiskey is that every now and again you get a whiskey that comes along and it really goes blows your expectations well away, or you you know what you think about certain distilleries. But uh, anyway, oh oh, that was good. Right, okay, time to finish off with a bit of Kohlila then. Let's see what the nose gives us on this then, shall we? Classically old school Kohlila. Crisp, fresh, briny, um, citric. But there's almost a kind of estery, bananary kind of fruit lurking beneath. Bit of apricot, apple, vanilla. Plenty of salt. Really complex. Um, for an 11 year old whiskey and I can see why they bottled it in the um, celebration of the cask range because this is just a damn good cask I mean you know this would have carried on aging I mean I know they have released some very old coal levers uh, which have been very very good but yeah I can see why they released this this is absolutely lovely it just shows you how well rounded and um, how good Kulila can actually be and, we, and I think sometimes we kind of forget about it because Diageo has kind of whacked the price up of the distillery bottlings and now they're stupidly priced for anything other than a sort of well even the 12 year old is what 50 odd quid which I suppose is part of the course but um, you know the 18 year old is stupidly priced now um, and um, but it's just you know every now and again just it's just nice to kind of reacquaint yourself with 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 how good Kalila actually is, um, and my God this is good. Let's see what the palate gives. Rich, malty, almost chocolatey, really salty, fairly heavily peated, um, quite gritty but soft. Um, again, it's got some lovely weight fruit underneath uh, all the peat and the, 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 the tar and the um, the oak. Actually, it's got quite a lot of oak for coal either, it has to be said. But again, it's not the intrusive oak. It's again, it's kind of just giving it some sort of support, some weight, some balance, um, lovely salty finish, it's got that crisp old schooly Kohlila kind of fresh citric note on the finish along with the saltiness, it's sort of like almost rock salt, um, I mean yes that's 57%, I'm going to put a little drop of water with it, I, again it's like the Westport, I really don't think it actually needs it but we'll just see what actually happens. Um, Lovely kind of pulped, almost tequila-y kind of fruit finish, or oh, aftertaste I should say. Um, really interesting, really very, very good. Less peat, uh, now with uh, dilution, um, more esters, more, more banana-y notes, you know, kind of. A little bit more oak, a little bit more barley. The, the, the peat is a certainly more softened, it's more a sort of like a... A slight smokiness now. Um, yeah, I'm getting tangerine. I'm getting oh, touch rose petal, but not that kind of mari rose petal, kind of sweet rose petal. A little bit of strawberry, possibly. I mean, it's, just, it's complex for an eleven-year-old. I mean, stunning. Um, and not expensive either, I think. I mean, well, all right, for an 11 year old whiskey, it's about 90 quid. But for the quality of this, you know, hmm, boy, that's bloody good. Let's see what the palette's like now, shall we? A 
round up, full up, more barley. Again, less pe less of the peat. It's more of a distant smokiness, shall we say? Um, a bit of a smoke on the water moment, shall we say? Um, less of the um, citrus and the um, intense saltiness, and it's more kind of focused on the slight oiliness. It feels more modern Kalila now, it has to be said, um, with that slightly weightier spirit. Um, personally, I think I, I kind of prefer it at, at sort of natural strength, personally. But again, either way, I think that's really, really good. And it's still got, you know, it's got a, 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 again, a nice kind of salty aftertaste. So um, I'm impressed. <laughs> Okay, so let's wrap today's episode of the show up then. Um, so again, a big, big thank you to Khan Moore for continually sending samples. I always look forward to what they're up to and the fact that they, you know, bottle what, once a quarter or something like that. You know, it's, it's not like um, I'm all... And the fact that I can buy odd bottles. And so that basically means that pretty much every time they do a release, I'm going to buy something. I don't have to commit to full cases uh, like some of the other independents and thereby only buy every now and again. But anyway, that's by the by. Wardhead, brilliant value for money. Really like that. Um, classically Glenfiddich and I love a quirky malt, as you well know. Um, Glen Keith was... Yeah, it's difficult to say whether it was the star of the show. It was certainly wonderfully mature and just, you know, um, the sort of old whiskey that I really, really like. Um, and, you know, I would certainly quite happily sell that. Um, the Klein Elish, um, well, yeah, yeah quality-wise, I can't argue with it. It's all sherry, it's and no trousers to a certain extent. I mean, it's not a big monster, but again, it's kind of like, you know, you're paying money for the for the name, and it to me, it doesn't quite deliver what I would want. Um, but then, you know, that's that's a Sherry Klein Ellis. And you can say exactly the same for the Highland Park. Yes, all right, the palate is probably more interesting than the nose, but it's not worth 245 quid, in my personal opinion, and I wouldn't feel comfortable selling it at that. Um, and hence, I didn't buy it. Simple. Um, the leche, well, maybe that probably should be whiskey of the of the day because it's just something it shouldn't be. It just completely blew me away. You know, old leche should taste of wet cardboard and you know um, all the other sort of peculiar uh, anomalies of that particular whiskey. But you know, damn, damn, that was good. Um, and the Kalila, yeah, absolutely lovely Kalila. Again, I quite happily stick that on the shelf. Um, quite happily sort of like charging 90 quid for it, you know. Um, it's just a bloody good Kalila. And um, yeah, there you go. Uh, that's this week's episode of the show in the bag. Um, I don't know if I've actually got these up on the website yet. I just, just ridiculously busy this week. It's just been one of those sort of weeks. Um, it, uh, if I haven't got them up on the website, just, just and, and you're really interested and you think, you know, I really must have a bottle of that, just ping me an email, you know how to contact me. Um, a little word about next couple of episodes of the show. Um, North Star Series 6, need I say any more? Emails will probably be going out sort of Monday, Tuesday of next week with what Ian has released in Series 6 and I ain't got a big allocation so you're going to have to bear with me on that one but I will obviously do my best to um, accommodate as where as possible and so the next couple of shows um, yes the next couple of shows will be given over to uh, the, the, the new North Star stuff so um, anyway um, until then um, I'm going to have some inordinately good old leche Good ramming and good afternoon.